Welcome to the Norris Group Real Estate Podcast, a show committed to bringing you insights from thought leaders shaping the real estate industry. In each episode, we'll dive into conversations with industry experts and local insiders, all aimed at helping you thrive in an ever-changing real estate market, continuing the legacy that Bruce Norris created, sharing valuable knowledge, and empowering you on your real estate journey. Whether you're a seasoned pro or a newcomer, this is your go-to source for insider tips, market trends, and success strategies. Here's your host, Craig Evans. When I first started, I had some, you know, I didn't have any idea what I was doing. And I was just mailing offers. That's all I did. And it was interesting because um, there were things that happened for me that would would never have happened if I asked, is this a good idea? So within like the first month, I had made an offer on six new custom homes in in Riverside County. And uh, and back then, this is 1980, they were asking 200 and I made 120 offer and it got accepted. And the owner of the company was like flabbergasted. Are are you kidding me? They was He was blown away because he was just used to buying you know, junky stuff in San Bernardino and Riverside that needed a lot of work. And these were brand new homes. I didn't know what I was doing, but I, I just wrote offers. And sure. uh, yeah, I took, a, I took a lot of heat. Yeah, we, we had lots of people mad at us, calling my broker all the time going, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> One of the offers was in uh, after, after those six were accepted, he says, let's throw you in Newport Beach. I want to see if you can buy a waterfront property. And in three days, I was in I was in front of one that was worth it was listed for a million fifty. Our offer was six fifty, and uh, the guy, after arguing, agreed to the six fifty, but he wanted a ten day escrow. And I had to call back the owner of the company. I got the ten days if I could get his boat included in the purchase. So that was a. Uh, I'm 28 years old and I've got 31 days of experience. And I say, well, I've got good news for you. I got your 650. I got your 10 days. All I need is your boat. <laughs> and uh, five minutes after getting yelled at, I got their boat. And when I left that house that night, I remember thinking, wow, what's possible if you just have the nerve to ask? And you know, uh, that's Bruce, like, that's so incredible that you said that. And you know, I, I refer back to, to, to Mike again, because I could do this all day. But, um, you know, Mike, it might have been Mike who pioneered it. I don't know. But that's where I heard it. Um, you know, writing offers is like playing the lottery for free. And it's just so true. And I tell Lawrence and Drew that all the time. I'm like, guys, we just got to make more offers. It's we're playing the lottery here. And real estate's an imperfect market. And you'd be surprised at what, what deals you can do when you just put pen to paper. Well, you know what? Sometimes your circumstance, the owner's circumstance changes. I'll tell you a story about myself. My wife and I had had three boys. And when when Aaron was born, he was the third boy. My wife wanted a girl. And we we met with uh, the adoption agency and found out we had we owned too small a house. And I had a home that was for sale up the street. And I had it uh, within a few days. I had a chance to buy a 150 grand house for 76 grand and all of a sudden my motivate had changed. Now the guy that was the realtor got an offer for my $85,000 house for 62 grand. And I just happened to meet him and he says, I'm so embarrassed that I have to give you this offer. And he said the offer and it was 62 grand and I had a residence that was similar. And I told him, I said, well, not only will I say yes to that offer, I'll only say yes to that if the guy pays 62 grand for the house I live in. And the realtor about fell off his chair. But my circumstances had changed. I wanted a home where I could get a baby girl. And I bought it so cheap that I could pay for it with a net of those two little houses and live in a 48 or 2,800 square foot house where the professors lived. So I was a motivated seller and all of a sudden it made sense. So you, you never know what circumstances are on the other side of that. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we get calls all the time, Bruce, from someone who said, 
hey, I got your letter two years ago and I put it yeah. in the drawer and I wasn't ready then, but my mom just passed away and now we want to sell the house. Oh, and by the way, can you get this done in a week? And, um, you know, like that happens and it happens a lot. But again, it comes back to consistency. You have to do it regularly and and like and, and do it over time. And then those things will happen. So your your main concentration now, are you concentrating on inventory that you can add an ADU or some other square footage? Yes and no. Um, we The way I'm looking at the next couple of years is like, for instance, I have a, a nine unit uh, building that I bought a property in an amazing A location that we're, we're turning one house into nine units in, in, in this uh, this project. I think I mentioned this what? to you last time. Yeah, wow. I was still in, in permitting phase when I when I talked to you last time. Um, okay. And there are some cool opportunities like that. And I think I'm focusing on having one or two of those, for me, bigger projects going at a time while the bread and butter for us is is still flipping houses and uh, and peeling off rentals where we can, where, where the numbers may may or may or not or, or make sense. Now, there there is something I want to mention that I think is um, I think may change the game a little here in San Diego, maybe not too much because our lots are somewhat small, but for instance, um, I have a, a house in, in La Mesa, which is a suburb of San Diego. And it's a six, no, 8,000 square foot lot with a three bedroom, two bath house on it. And, um, what I'm doing is I am building another three bedroom, two bath house on the back of this lot. Now, granted, the city of La Mesa's ADU ordinance only allows one unit, so I, I couldn't go any denser. So I'm going to build the biggest one I can as a three bedroom, two bath. Um, and but I'm doing a manufactured house and I am. The, the difference, though, is I'm going to leave it stucco ready. So when we're done, we're going to stucco the exterior. And we're going to just make a couple of extra bells and whistles. So this property will look like the stucco house on the front of the lot. But my build costs uh, are are at about 225 a foot. Whereas the Kensington project, the nine unit project, you're at like 375 a foot. So we're mm -hmm. getting a huge discount for going manufactured. But my rent is going to be the same as, as the house in the front. So I've been looking lately for for lots in San Diego that are in certain zone base zones with certain overlays that allow you bonus ADUs based off of you allowing one of the other ADUs to be income uh, restricted. So if you do one at, at low to moderate income, then they give you a bonus. They say, cool, if you're going to designate one of your units to be lower moderate income, mm -hmm. then we'll give you another bonus ADU you can build. Um, now, granted the, the, you know, the manufactured house, they're single story and they require space. So you got to have a big enough lot. And in San Diego, they're, they're hard to find, um, but they're still out there. And so I think that there's a cool little opportunity for a while, while some of these lots are still found and figured out to, to throw some manufactured house on it and, 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 and houses on it. And because of the, the bill costs are much lower than the stick built counterpart, um, their returns are, are therefore accelerated quite a bit and makes sense. They actually make sense to hold here. Whereas it's really hard to typically make these things pencil. Have you heard of boxable? Mm -mm. I have not. Yeah. Okay. That's Elon Musk's manufactured home. Basically mm -hmm. that's that comes in a, I think it's, I think it's 800 square feet. It comes delivered in a trailer and it unfolds on your lot. It's done. I love that. So you just have to what have the all the utilities, foundation, et cetera, all that done, and then right. Yeah, okay. look look that up. Boxable. It's uh, it it's gonna be it's gonna be a big deal, like everything else he touches. You know. Of course. Yeah, I just read his book or his his biography. Um, super cool. I, I am just astounded at what goes on in his head. Yeah, like he I, thinks different than the common person. Like even the successful entrepreneur, like he's like he had these like massive ideas and dreams that, like, yeah. Well, it's, it's just, like they, it really they don't cool even exist. They don't even exist. The stuff he's thinking of. He was asked, uh, "When did you know you were different?" 
He said, when I was six, it dawned on me that none of this that's going on in my head is going on in anybody else's. <laughs> yeah. yep. It's like bursting ideas. I'm just curious, um, you know, from the interest rate of the good old days to now, we're, we're about tripled, close to it. What impact has, had, has that had on San Diego price? Not that much, Bruce. Um, you know, there was a, a freak out moment back in May of 2022 when the rates started to spike and buyer sentiment fell precipitously and we saw a hit in pricing around that point. So Q2, Q3, 2022 was tough. I personally lost money on multiple deals that I had bought at Q1 buyer mood and sentiment and pricing and interest rate, therefore had to sell in the end of Q2, Q3 at that timing of interest rates and mood, et cetera. And the prices were certainly affected and um, definitely lost significant amount of money, like like enough to make you vomit a little bit. Um, and uh, which is, which is okay though, because it, 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 it shaped the way I looked at deals moving forward. I will admittedly say that I got a little loose with my underwriting at the time. And I got a little caught up in the euphoria. And I probably bought properties I normally wouldn't. For instance, a couple of the properties I bought, uh, I, I bought that I lost money on. Um, I normally don't buy because I've had bad experiences with them. I bought one house that didn't have a garage. In a, in a neighborhood in San Diego that everybody wants a garage. I bought another house where I was using a new construction comparable sale. Granted, it was a block away, but it was new construction. And I knew that the comps may or may, this may not, may or may not work and it didn't work. Um, and another one was backed up against a hillside off of a busy road. And I, you know, at the time it didn't matter what you had, everything was selling. Um, but right. I normally wouldn't buy that stuff. And I'm not buying it anymore. Um, so it it uh, it kind of shaped the way I, I ran my business. Um, but to get back to your original question, pricing has rebounded, and it didn't take long. Um, you know, back towards the middle part of of last year in 2023, we're already back to the pricing we saw uh, pre interest rate boom. If if uh, it felt like there was an initial shock, the and and then. Buyers started to absorb the idea that, hey, this is this is where the new normal is going to be for a while. And coupled out with the lack of inventory, you know, it's people are still paying paying it, and they and they're 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 happy to do it. And matter of fact, all of our recent sales have had multiple offers. Well, it's interesting that you just said that lack of lack of inventory. So, from what I've studied. The market needs to have a group of inventory that has, has the, ca the characterization, it has to sell. So if you think about how that could come about, foreclosures can occur, but that isn't going to occur this time. You can, you can go online to YouTube and it looks like, oh my gosh, you know, and they always use percentages. So, you, yeah. you know, they don't, they don't use the numbers when they use percentages, but you know, so you go to nine to 27 foreclosures, you're up 300%. Oh my God. Right. And then you, you realize it's meaningless. So we just did a presentation in Florida. Their market is very stable price-wise. And the percentage of short sales and REOs combined are half a percent of the volume. Yeah, that's, that, that doesn't move any needles. No needles moving. Matter of fact, see, that's the part like you in 1980 and 81, you had 16, 17% interest, 10% unemployment, 22 months of supply of inventory, no price damage. Those three charts together just make your head scratch. You go, oh my God. And so, you, you know, you're looking at what was, what was stable here that went crazy in 2008 and nine and 10. It was the REOs. The REOs dictated the value of everything. And in the 90s, they did somewhat. They had, it was 40% of the market. So I look at that and say, you know, we're not going to touch that this time. But 
if I were, and I am uh, an investor, I, I constantly look at, is there another supply of houses that could alter the outcome? Because you don't have a lot of volume of sales, right? San Diego is about half of normal. No. Yeah, we don't. It's uh, it, it's, it is about half. And like I, before we jumped on here, I looked at the numbers and if you just type in active for sale, detached homes in, in San Diego County today, we're at like a little over 1400 of a County of 3 million people. Um, yeah. it, it's, it, it really is, is rock bottom and certain little neighborhoods have less than others. And, you know, that may or may not be certain neighborhoods we're targeting with some of our mailers is, you know, if you can get any sort of inventory in some of these, some of these neighborhoods that have nothing for sale, even if you're, you're you pay a little more than you want to, you, you still end up being all right. Cause there's, there's nothing else. Do you, do you fear any inventory? So in Florida, you can look at a couple of things. You can say VRBOs, for instance, there's a lot of, a lot of VRBOs. If those stop working for some reason, maybe they get put up for sale and the quantity, I, I don't even know if there's a chart on how many those are, but in Florida, there's a lot of deaths because of older people. So eventually you produce 50,000 homes a year in because people died. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, San, San Diego, the Airbnb thing is interesting. Um, I, I have a couple myself um, and granted, depending on the area you're in, like city of San Diego has their own rules and regulations. City of La Mesa has their own. And, um, and so it, it depends where you're at, but city of San Diego, for example, and I, I, I don't want to be quoted on these numbers, but I'm pretty sure these are correct. They offered something around 5,000 permits for, for short-term rentals. And everyone in the, in the industry was like, Oh man, you got to get your application in. It's going to be a, a feeding frenzy and who, you know, people are going to be fighting for these, these permits. Well, actually after they released them, not all of them were taken. They're only, only something like 3,500 were actually applied for. And so how many of those were bought recently underwriting as short-term rentals? Maybe some, um, but how many of those have been properties bought over the last seven, eight years at a low interest rate? Uh, probably a lot. How many of those were owned for many years before that, whether, you know, uh, no mortgage or paid with cash or something, probably some. So even if let's just say the rug was pulled out from underneath uh, the short term rental market, is that really going to create a huge splash of in inventory? I, I don't I don't think so. There will be some, but I don't think that much well, here. It's not just the inventory. It has to be motivated, have to sell inventory. That's what, because somebody yeah. could just say no, right? In 1980, you got 22 months of inventory, but apparently there was enough people that said, never mind. Sure. You know, so right now in California, we're at the highest, it takes the highest percentage of our median income ever to buy a house. And normally that's followed by some type of correction. And how much so is that? You know, 70%. 70%. 70 percent is the median okay you take the median price to 20 percent down apply the interest rate it takes 70 percent of the median income so but that includes what 35 percent of people are buying cash so it, it's no one's qualifying for 70 percent of a house payment but right. but the chart's accurate in the sense and that's this is the chart we renamed moodometer so a moodometer basically calculates the urgency of the buyer. So you have urgency of the buyer in San Diego because there's nothing for sale and they want one. Okay. So they have to pay a premium. That number, when you go to say a, a depression mentality in 2008 goes to 28, but it's very normal to go a decade and not get over 40. So that's how exuberant California is right now. Well, what could change that, Bruce? Like, what, 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 what would it be? Would it be a another series of large interest rate hikes? Uh, would it be some sort of massive job loss? Like, what, what could possibly change that in in Southern California? 
you know, if, if we've already gone through the largest interest rate hike in like multiple decades and, and buyers absorb that, um, like what, what would, could be a catalyst for a, a big moodometer change? I don't think there will be one actually. I think what's going to happen is I think you'll return to a, a lower number, but say 50, 55%. But as far as inflation, expecting real estate to inflate, that'll be really interesting if that happens. So let's, let's just play within a year, interest rates are 5%. What group gets off the sidelines, the seller or the buyer? That's a good question. I, you know, uh, I love being, reading John Burns stuff. You know, the magic number he has is 5.5%. Um, I think, you know, that's a good question. I think it depends on what, which seller, right? Does that seller need to go replace their, their house with another, another high, high balance mortgage? Are they downsizing? Um, you know, I, I think it could, it could probably get both off the sidelines. I think it leans toward the buyer. I think that's why your volume's so low. I think your volume is low because people are just, they're just waiting. They don't want a seven or an eight or a, you know, but if that gets into five territory, I think the people that come off the sidelines are the buyer. And because the interest rate is now lower, it'll take less of their percentage of income. They'll also be getting raises. So I think, you know, for the next seven, eight years, you've got this journey of gradually that number of 70% goes down just because the earnings are higher, the interest rates lower. And I don't think you have that urgent moment of all of this stuff is for sale, but this is, see, what's fun about this is this has never happened. And so whenever you look at charts, you usually look at what's repeating here. And this isn't repeating, which is why we, when we did the report on charted territory was a tongue in cheek, title basically saying this is yeah this is uncharted we haven't seen these com combination and the other thing um derek is there were for like about almost two years over a i want to say gosh I, i'm about to say trillion it is right a trillion dollars of refis every quarter every every quarter there was refis we we didn't have that many houses so what happened was people said, oh, my God, look at that. Four and three quarters. Never thought I'd saw that. Oh, my God, look at four. Oh, 2.75. I think a lot of the same people refied over and over again. And what also happened during that journey is, let's say, when you refied at four and three quarters and then at two and three quarters, it dawned on you, wow, we could add an office and have a pool and we won't even change our payment. The loan amount will go up, but our payment won't. And so I think people built in their permanent home and I don't think those people are going anywhere. No, you know, I, I've talked about this with, with my wife too. I'm like, I look around, I'm like, we have 3% uh, interest rate on, on our house. And when you compare it to what else we can get for it, it like at today's rates, you know, the, the mortgage almost doubles and it's like, you know, honey, I don't, I don't think, you know, we need that. We, like, we're thinking about maybe a second story or whatever we're doing, you know, maybe add some space um, building out a little bit. But I think a lot of people are having those conversations and, and a lot of people are, 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 are doing it now, even as opposed to back then as well. What percentage of San Diego's uh, sales are cash, would you say? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. I'd be, I'd be guessing, to be honest. Um, okay. But I, I don't. I don't think that much. I, I would say maybe maybe ten percent. Really, mm -hmm. that would surprise me to be that low. Well, I mean, really. So who are who are these cash buyers? Are we talking to strike writing checks for for owner occupied homes or? Yeah. Uh, are you talking yeah. investment? No, no, no. People coming to live. Do you have migration coming in from somewhere? San Diego, not really. We have a lot of out migration. We, we have a lot of immigration, um, but we, we, we certainly don't have that, that much in migration from other states. Okay. Well, that's except, the advantage. Except maybe like so NorCal. We get some like San Francisco tech guys that come down, some guys from LA, 
but we're starting to catch up to them in pricing. So it's no longer as attractive. That's true. You know what, where we build homes, uh, there was Cape Coral and Rotunda West. You know what the percentage of cash buyers are? 65. I'm, I'm guessing 50 or 60. 65%. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So that's a big help when the financing goes up. It's like, eh. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. It, uh, that, that, those people don't care. They're not interest rate sensitive. Um, I just Googled it really quick. And according to Financial Samurai, I've never heard of that, but um, it looks like in San Diego, it was like, what was that? 25%. So yeah, you were, yeah. you were yeah, spot on. How many times have you gotten to say, I talked with my wife? That's a no, new sentence for you. I'm still getting <laughs> used to it. Yeah, it's so funny. We, we both are are not quite used to saying wife or husband or hubby or whatever pet name. <laughs> um, but it's, well, it's been fun. Yeah, that is that is so cool. Um, I'm glad you recognized who she was and that you guys tied the knot. And you have a wonderful future, man. That's pretty exciting. Thank you. I'm very grateful and blessed and so thankful for all those along the way who, who have helped and, you know, nobody gets there alone. Nobody does it unless they're independently wealthy without borrowing money. You know, it's, it, there's just so many factors that go into it and I'm just so grateful for, you know, all the help I've had along the way. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your success and thank you for contributing to other people's success by the roles that you have taken. For sure. Can I ask you one quick question? Sure. Okay. Um, so, you know, I love at our, at our interviews at the NSTRAI, I always like to, to, to finish it with like, uh, you know, a question like, you know, uh, fill in the blank or a, uh, or something along those lines, something fun. But, um, in, in, in this case, um, you know, first let's say someone in San Diego is listening to this right now, and you're familiar with San Diego, similar to most Southern California markets, like, where, where is a, 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 what is the lens someone in San Diego in the investment space should be looking, looking through and right. You have these meetings every week. You're like, all right, guys, we, we are running an investment business here in San Diego. How do we project the next five to 10 years? Like what, what do you tell that person that says, Bruce, sit at our, in our board meeting and, uh, and help us, help us look through the lens of the next five to 10 years and how we, how we potentially see what, what, what may be happening. I think over, over a long period of time, real estate has already used up its upside. So I don't think you're going to make yourself a lot of money by buying and holding something and having it do its normal journey where, you know, you have 50% equity in five years, that'll have to be built into something. So the process has to be, okay, I'm going to buy something, that exists and add value to it. So like what you're doing is perfect. Adding ADUs uh, or another house behind it or improving what you've got. The other thing is I'd mentioned that one of the things that happened to me, I got into the business in 1980 in November. So interest rates were completely crazy, but prices from 1975 to 80 had tripled. And that was a really interesting thing about getting my offers accepted because people were saying yes to offers at 65% of value and making more than they ever thought they would on a house. So that was part of the what was going on in their head is they were thinking, okay, I put up, you know, 15 grand to get into this house and I'm netting a hundred. It was just, a, it was a calculation. And I started actually doing that. I would ask questions about, just curious, what did somebody have to put as a down payment uh, in this neighborhood? And of course they would answer me, well, we put 20%, $20,000 down or something. And then later that would, be, that would be part of my formula saying, you know, if they were upset at the number, they couldn't be upset at the yield. And so sure. I think you have to think like that. I think you have to take a look at what people just, what happened to, account, uh, what happened to San Diego real estate from let's say 2008 to now, has it tripled? Probably. Yeah, more probably. Yeah. yeah. So I would, when you're looking for a discount, that's not a normal upside on a house. So could they just take a double and leave the last third for you? Yeah, it, it happens <laughs> if you sure. ask. 
Yeah. So that's, I guess that's what I would do. I would look for people that have huge equities and maybe a change in life. You know, like I was adopting Sarah or I needed a bigger house or you, you name it. People have, you just have to have opportunity, give opportunities for people to say yes. Uh, one of my favorite comments from agents when I bought houses was if, if I knew they would take that offer, I would have bought it myself, but they never made the offer. We've had some top producing agents at the NSD REI over the years, and I'm always baffled uh, as to, uh, you know, uh, typically, and this is not, not a knock on it, on, on all of them, but I, I, it's hard for me to understand like, Hey, you, you have access to all this inventory off market because they're your deals. Um, and you're not buying any of them. Why? Uh, and I, I think it, a lot of it's a mindset thing and a fear, et cetera. But I, a lot of those have shifted. I know a lot of those guys have, have shifted their, their, their game and it's been cool to see, but, um, but anyway, one of the, one of the properties I bought when I worked for the company. So I only worked there for 90 days. So somewhere in that time frame, I bought this house and the, I, I made the offer and the lady that was the agent, she stood up and screamed at me and the buyer, but the seller said, sit down and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so she, when she got out, I said, what was all that about? She said, I was, I was figuring he was going to be pissed. So I was just defending uh, him so I could get, keep my listing. I said, Oh, okay. <laughs> it was all a farce really. But you know, the guy wanted to take the offer. Um, I don't know. I just, I just think you, people don't ask enough. And sometimes, and sometimes it's, it's circumstance driven. I'll tell you one story. You maybe have already heard it, but this is this is typical of if you ask enough questions. We we finally decided to do a, a boot camp where we're teaching people live in the Riverside office. I bought the building to do that, and the first time we had a training, there was a we ran an ad and people called in. A guy said, "You know, I got a hundred forty grand house. It's all completely fixed. I just need to toss carpet in. I'll take one twenty for it." So the person that took the phone call. They couldn't get him to go off of the, the 120, no matter what they did. So hung up. And that was the end of the call. I said, I'm going to call the guy back because um, I'm just curious why he doesn't toss carpet in and sell it for 140. So I, I called up and asked that question. He said, um, I don't have time. I said, well, here, let me save you some time. There's no investor I know that's going to buy a 140 house for 120. He said, how about 100? I said, no. How about 90? I said, why don't you just list it? He said, I told you, I don't have time. What's the element of time? I have a chance to buy a $500,000 business this week for 72 grand. I said, so if I walk over 72 grand, you own the business. Are we good? He said, yes. So there's just questions that are, you know, you just have to say, okay, did I get to the bottom of it? And yeah. on that one, it was just a few questions away. Yeah. That, that what is their true motivation? Their why? No, that's, that's a really good um, a, a really good story and uh, just along the lines of, of helping people buy stuff. I'm a huge advocate for it. So I've, I've numerous times um, helped people who were either A, just getting started or B, agents who wanted to break over into the investment ownership world and happy, happy to do it, right? You don't need all the deals, but if you help create a you know, a plan, a vision and a lifestyle for someone else, um, it comes back to you. And so some of those guys that, uh, you know, that we've helped along the way are still come back and bring us deals, but you know, they're now in the ownership world, they have portfolios and they're flipping houses or whatever it is, but it's really cool yeah. to see. Well, you know, it's interesting. You said 60% of your business comes from referrals. That's from probably, is that mostly agents? Mostly agents. Yeah. Okay. So those listings aren't seeing the light of day. No, they just, uh, every now and then, yeah, every now and then one will have to per whatever agreement they have with the seller or a trust attorney or whatever. But for the most part, no, uh, most of them will, will just go get marked pending and sold on the same day. Yeah. Well, that is a good group of agents to have because they'll find those things all year. You know, that's it, what they do. Exactly. Yep. And we, <laughs> we take care of them for sure. We're happy to pay, extra commissions. Like we work out, uh, bonuses. So like, let's say we hit our, our ARV or more, well then they'll get X percentage bump and whatever. Like we want to share the wealth because we know like they'll come back to us. Absolutely. That's smart. 
All right, Derek, I better let you go. Hey, I've had a great time. Go ahead. Oh, always nice chatting with you, sir. And uh, please don't be a stranger at the NSD area. I know you kind of have shut down your 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 worldwide speaking tour, but um, you know <laughs> if that may may ever change in the future, we would love love to host you again. Okay. For more information on hard money loans, trustee investing, and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For more information on passive investing through the DBL Capital Real Estate Investment Fund, please visit dblcapital.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under the California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 16236669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.